Hey everyone, welcome to part two of our lecture on the cell. So, so far we talked about cells in general. Uh, we took a look at the nucleus, we took a look at size constraints of cells, and we took a look at ribosomes and a little bit at the, of the cell membrane as well. But now we're really gonna get into the cell itself. And the majority of the cell is going to classify as something called the endomembrane system. And its overall function is to regulate protein traffic and perform metabolic functions in the cell. Okay. That being said, this picture here, let's let's talk about what we're looking at. So here we have that nucleo, uh, the nucleus with the nucleolus on the inside. But as soon as you get outside of the nucleus, you can see we start to uh, run into these, in this case, this pink set of membranes that kind of goes back and forth. And then it kind of turns into these tubes here. The tubes are kind of doing some releasing of these little spheres. Uh, some of them seem to be running into this stack here of flattened membranes as well. Some of those little spheres are coming from that. Some are going in different directions. So the key here and why it's called the endomembrane system is it's all made of membrane. From the nuclear membrane itself on outward, almost every structure that you encounter along the way here of those things we just described are composed of membranes. They literally have phospholipid content in them, a lipid bilayer that ultimately governs their structure. Okay, so let's look at some of the organelles that apply. So we said the nuclear membrane itself, the endoplasmic reticulum is the next structure out. So that's all this pink stuff here. And we got two types, we got rough and smooth. We have the Golgi apparatus, that's this big thing right here. We have lysosomes. So lysosomes, um, here's an example of a lysosome right here. Okay, so you can see it has a spherical body to it. There's membrane involved as well. Uh, we have what are known as vacuoles too. Um, now this, if I can be more precise about this, the lysosome actually buds off of this structure here. And at this point right here, it combines with a food vacuole. A food vacuole has, um, it also has a membranous outside. And, it, and this one here, it's holding in some food. And when it combines with a lysosome, something really unique happens. And we'll get into that in the slides ahead. And lastly, we have the plasma membrane itself, which was the original lipid bilayer we talked about. So lots and lots of lipids and um, membranous material in focus here as we talk about this endomembrane system and you know we're starting to get into the organelles of eukaryotic cells remember eukaryotic cells have membrane bound organelles so that means they're made of membrane okay all right so these components are either uh, continuous or connected uh, via transfer by vesicles. So once you're leaving like the middle of the cell and you start heading outward, which is ultimately the direction of flow, if you look at all these arrows, they're basically going from the inside to the outside. These little tiny spherical droplets here, these are your vesicles. And whether you're going from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi or from the Golgi complex out to the exterior of the cell itself, Whatever's in there is going to take a ride via these spherical membranous vesicles. They're made of membrane. Now, um, outside of the nuclear membrane, which also is referred to as a nuclear envelope, you can see it right here, has that double layer, the inner uh, nuclear membrane and the outer. You're then going to run into the endoplasmic reticulum, which is blue. Um, all throughout here with these with these very very visible folds and the endoplasmic reticulum you kind of think of it like a biosynthetic factory okay now endoplasmic reticulum it's a lot to say it's a lot to, to write so um, sometimes we just use the shorthand version we call it the ER in science and it accounts for more than half the total membrane in many eukaryotic cells so it's quite extensive if more than 50% of the membrane inside of a cell is endoplasmic reticulum you know there's uh, quite a bit of um, uh, concentration and and membranous component to those cells due to this particular organelle Okay, um, ER membrane is continuous with the nuclear envelope, and we can see that right here. They actually connect. 
And there's going to be two distinct regions of the ER. We have what's known as the smooth ER. And you can see we just popped up the label for that one. And what's so smooth about it? Well, if you look at it, these tubes here are pretty clean on the outside, right? Compare that to all these, which have those little brown dots, which in our last lecture we said those were the ribosomes. So that's going to be called rough ER because they're coated in ribosomes. They stud its surface, we say. And then whenever you have a central portion of a tube or a cavity, it often gets the term called lumen. So lumen, um, biologically speaking, is the hole within a tube or a cavity. We also have cisternae as a word, and that's, we're talking about basically these, these fold, these flattened sacs that we see here of membrane. Uh, they're often called cisternae. And we can also see a little directional arrow here because, again, we said that there's a lot of vesicle transfer, uh, transfer from one structure to another. So this little this little one here is going to butt off of here and it's going to float away, perhaps um, reaching its ne next destination in a few seconds. And down here we also have a TEM, um, one of our transition electron micrographs of rough ER versus smooth. Again, notice all the dots, right? We said the dots were the ribosomes that stud the surface. And again, ribosomes are protein factories. So as they get messages that come in from the, um, uh, the come in from the nucleus on RNA, what they're going to do is they're going to turn it into proteins. Okay, so imagine, um, you know, we have some RNA floating down this way and coming to these ribosomes. Now, these RNA molecules, and I'll just kind of draw it as a squiggly line here, is going to pass through these ribosomes, and then the ribosomes are going to build a protein. And remember, proteins are um, basically amino acid chains, and they wind up folding upon themselves. So as it threads through a ribosome, it's going to build a protein while it does that. And that's, that's really the job of the ribosomes and, and the way the system works. Contrast this over here for a second with this. Notice there's not a whole lot of dots that represent ribosomes in the smooth ER portion. There's a few in here, but these are free. They don't really seem to be bound by membranes like you see over here, kind of strapped to the surface. Next, we're going to talk about the functions of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. First of all, uh, they make more lipids, okay? So being that, you know, we said some of the ER makes more than a uh, composition of 50% of the cell's content, so you need a lot. And that smooth endoplasmic reticulum constantly creating those vesicles that kind of butt off of it, um, that's going to keep that a pretty stable amount. Another thing that um, lipids can be are hormones that these smooth ERs can put out. So hormones are essentially chemicals that are released into organisms, uh, we'll say blood streams or fluid compartments that affect something we could say physiologically or in terms of its metabolism. They'll have an effect somewhere else inside of that organism or cell. Smooth ER can also detoxify poison. So um, the key to detoxifying a, a poison, detoxifying a poison is to add hydroxyl groups to it. So there's some chemistry there, but if you remember, the hydroxyl group looked like that. It was OH. It was like you know two-thirds of a water molecule. And that's the key. It's really similar to water. So if I plant a whole bunch of OHs all over another chemical structure. I just made it really similar to water. And if I make it really similar to water, it has a greater possibility of being flushed from the body of the organism, right? So ultimately, you know, the mechanism that allows an organism to get rid of waste, if that toxin or poison is really water-like, it gives that organism a good chance of surviving it because it gets rid of it out of its body pretty fast. Okay, so detoxifying poison is another um, 
another function. And, uh, you know, we'll just kind of throw this out there. Think of your body. Can you think of an organ that detoxifies a uh, toxin itself or uh, rips apart poisons? Um, if you can, jot it down and then uh, we'll talk about it um, in class. All right, lastly, we have calcium storage, okay? So this endoplasmic reticulum can store calcium. Calcium is absolutely essential to living things. Um, it causes um, everything from allowing one cell to communicate with another to our species, which means your nervous system cells are able to function and release something called neurotransmitters so we can think and feel and, and be conscious. It allows our... Um, muscles to ultimately contract and relax. So it's very, very important that we have a good amount of calcium that's stored in this smooth ER. And I asked the question, can you think of a type of cell that contracts? And I think I just gave it away. So our muscle cells do. And lastly, we can talk about glucose formation, okay? Um, in a couple of places in our body, Glucose will ultimately turn into glycogen, and we talked about that in our there we go in our biomolecules lecture. So when you have a whole bunch of glucose around, you can string it into glycogen, right? And ultimately, that can be stored in a couple of places. We said earlier the liver and your muscles are good places to store glucose as larger molecules. So um, the glycogen aspect to storing glucose happens in the cells of the liver, which have a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in it. And by the way, while I'm just talking about the liver, since it's such a good place to find so much smooth ER, it's actually gonna be the one here. There you go. So the liver is your main detoxifying organ. Okay, so let's talk about rough ER for a moment as well. Um, it sits right next to the smooth ER. This has bound ribosomes, which secrete glycoproteins. Okay, so again, if we have a message on an mRNA molecule that's coming through here, um, what's going to happen is we're going to build a protein, but we can also attach a glyco part to it. Now, what does glyco look like to you? Okay, hopefully because of glycogen, you start thinking of glucose and you start thinking of sugars. And you can see here, proteins covalently bonded to carbohydrates. So ultimately you'll have, you know, the string of amino acids with a carbohydrate portion on it as well. And it's gonna build them and then it's gonna butt off and they're kind of float away from this structure. So it will release proteins surrounded by membranes and vesicles. So perhaps here's my lipid vesicle that's coming from here. And let's imagine that uh, we have a, we'll just say this is a really crude protein here, okay? Now, that's all fine and good, but that protein will also have, and let's just kind of change the color on it a little bit. Let's go to green. And let's say that this green bit right here are sugars, okay? So now we have a protein connected to sugars, and we would call this a glycoprotein. It would be stored in this round vesicle made of membrane. So you can see it's kind of, it's kind of building uh, materials and sending them outward from the nucleus. And many of these glycoproteins will be destined for the cell membranes. The last thing I want to say is remember um, our look at the cell membrane. We know that it was made of a sea of um, phospholipids. Those were those little tiny kind of two-part molecules with the hydrophilic head and the hydrophobic tails. And then Sitting interspersed in those, of course, were proteins, and some of them had branches off the top, okay? So this ultrastructure of a cell membrane is partially built by the job of the rough ER. This thing here is headed to the cell membrane surface to perhaps embed, and then this part here will stick out um, into the exterior environment outside of the cell. Next on our pathway of the endomembrane system, we have the Golgi apparatus. Again, get used to saying it and get 
used to writing it out um it just it just makes you more knowledgeable in the language of science and um it, it will sound better in your head too as you as you say it the proper way okay and I honestly think the best way to think of this one is a shipping and receiving center. Okay, so it, it's kind of like your 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 Amazon of uh, the cell, and that you know you have products coming in, you have products going out, and some of them get tweaked on the inside. The organelle consists of flattened membranous sacs called cisternae. Okay, and that's what these are. You can see a whole bunch of these membranous flattened sacs there. Um, they have a couple of faces associated with them, and it depends on whether it's receiving stuff from the from the ER or not. So the cis face is on the side here, and it's receiving the products from the ER that we were just talking about. The trans face here is the shipping side. So from this side over here, it's gonna these vesicles are going this way, which is gonna be towards the cell membrane itself. The functions are that it stores the products of the ER. So the cis face receives them. Here you can see there's some proteins in here and they're they're perhaps being modified in here and repackaged and gonna be sent on their way to another location in the cell. It will modify certain macromolecules. Um, it could add sugars, it could replace sugars, um, it could remove some uh, uh, sugars from a glycoprotein, depending on the need of the cell. And that's all dictated, of course, by the cellular metabolism and the DNA instructional code in the nucleus. And then it will package it up, whatever the new product is, and send it on its way. One of the types of vesicles that can leave the Golgi is called a lysosome. And a lysosome has um, ultimately some low pH hydrolytic enzymes on the interior. Okay, so here you can see the outside is a membrane, and on the inside you got these proteins, these hydrolytic enzymes. All right, now everything is there in the word. Remember, hydro means water, and then lytic means breaking. Okay, so the jobs of these little things inside your lysosome is to break things with water. All right, now. Let's imagine we have a food vacuole out here. We're on the outside of the cell, but it's going in. You can see right here the cell membrane kind of bubbles inward surrounding that food vacuole. And meanwhile, you got a lysosome that's been released by the Golgi apparatus that's on a pathway, and you can see the arrow right here, to ultimately combine with this food molecule. Okay. Now, when it does, these digestive enzymes on the interior are gonna spill in to that food, okay? The membranes will combine, and then suddenly you have these digestive enzymes going to work on that food vacuole. And they're gonna use water to go ahead and break it from something big to little tiny pieces like you can see here, okay? That's hydrolysis again. Big things into little things by using water. and Enzymes help make that go faster. Okay, and also remember with hydrolysis, you had really four, four different uh, types of biomolecules that could be broken down with water, and then removing the water from them could build them up again. So proteins, fats, polysaccharides, uh, nucleic acids, um, all those things can be broken up with the process of hydrolysis, catalyzed by enzymes, so sped up by these enzymes. So that would be the digestion, uh, the in, intracellular digestion of a food molecule. Another thing that can happen when you have an organelle that just kind of gets old and broken down and maybe malfunctioning a bit, um, these lysosomes can also hit an entire organelle like a mitochondria that's kind of, um, it's, it's, its life has, has run its course. It's kind of not doing its job as well as it could so it's going to spill these lysosomes will spill their their hydrolytic enzymes on the inside as they combine with it and it will digest the organelle itself here's another view same thing we were talking about we got um we got food coming in this way in a food vesicle it's wrapped in membrane here we have the golgi that has released a vesicle and that vesicle is a lysosome 
The two of them collide here. Their membranes uh, merge together and all of these red hydrolytic enzymes spill in with the green food, break it up and digest those food particles into something smaller. So now your cell can use them. Over here, we have a lysosome that is being released from the Golgi again, combining with a old mitochondria, spilling its contents on the inside, breaking down that org or old organelle, and then you can use the spare parts for something else inside the cell. The process of, you know, you just saw food going into a membrane from the side. We call that phagocytosis. And ultimately, it's kind of the engulfment of something on the outside, something typically solid that the cell wants um, on the inside. So lysosomes will fuse with a food molecule and digest it in that way. It kind of blobs around it and combines uh, both of their membranes together, merges their membranes. And we also mentioned that lysosomes use enzymes to recycle the cell's own organelles, which has a name. We actually call that autophagy. Okay, say it and spell it. Autophagy. So here you can see that um, the membrane of this bigger part right here is kind of wrapping around these Cheeto looking things here, which are some type of food for the cell. And here you, they're surrounded by lysosomes. I really like this picture. They're going to dump on the inside. They're going to break up those Cheeto things into all these little tiny pieces, and they're going to release it into the cell here. And now the cell can use all this stuff. Next on our list, we have vacuoles. These are organelles of storage. So we store things in vacuoles. Vacuoles are also uh, membranous structures. This is a really big vacuole right here. They don't, near, they don't have to be that big. They can be much smaller. And they can cont contain a whole bunch of stuff. Um, there could be food in them. There could be water in them. Uh, you could have enzymes inside and other small molecules, um, pigments and things like that. Some cells that uh, are... Um, in living things called protists, which are single-celled organisms for the most part, a lot of them will live in water, and they constantly have to get rid of extra water, so they'll have something called a contractile vacuole. Like, for example, this thing could actually like squeeze and squish water out if this is one of those that we were talking about. Now, this is actually um, a central vacuole for a plant cell, so this one doesn't do that, but in protists they can. So animal cells have less vacuoles than plant cells. Um, plant cells have more because they have to constantly store a lot of water. But animal cells can also contain lipids. So um, we have these things called adipocytes, which are um, essentially fat cells. And they can make uh, the fat inside of them can ultimately reach about two-thirds of the volume of the cell. It could just be stored lipids. Um, so uh, it could be quite significant on the inside of some of the vacuoles. Plant cells like this one here can contain water, sugars, pigments, and toxins in each one. So imagine, you know, your entire plant having these and all the green parts having these large central vacuoles that contain water. And, you know, it, it, that's how a plant stays healthy is when there's a good amount of water in there. When too much water leaves, and we can still use these blue arrows like this, we have less water coming in and more water leaving. What will happen is this cell will start to shrink on the interior and actually pull away from the cell wall that it has and become very unhealthy. Plant cells have this central vacuole, and in some plants it can take up to 90% of the volume of the cell. And when it does, it's actually kind of cool. Um, the vacuole will be about this big, and all of the other organelles will be squished in this area here surrounding it. And there actually is a little bit of flow that goes around it. You can actually watch it in plant cells, but the main, uh, and even the nucleus would be like squished out here somewhere. And you can, you can look at the flow underneath the microscope. Another very important organelle is going to be mitochondria, okay? So mitochondria are the sites of what we call cellular respiration, okay? We know what human respiration is, right? That's where we breathe. But cellular respiration ultimately is a process that generates ATP, okay? ATP, we learned in the biomolecule lecture, was a nucleic acid, which was like the energy currency of the body. So... 
the most common nickname of the mitochondria is powerhouse. Okay, they call it the powerhouse of the cell. Now, they're not officially part of the endomembrane system we've been talking about. Neither, um, um, uh, we're going to talk about the chloroplast in a minute, but this one is kind of like on its own. This one kind of has its own little life itself, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, it has its own double membrane has an inner and an outer, has proteins made by free ribosomes inside of it. And the interesting thing about them is they contain their own DNA that's different from the DNA inside of your nucleus. Okay, how weird is that? You have almost like this little, this little hitchhiker, evolutionary hitchhiker that got inside of our cells that has its own DNA for replication. And we're going to talk a lot about the mitochondria and why that's important in lectures to come. Let's go ahead and label some of the parts of a mitochondria. And here's the outer membrane. You can see it here and here in the TEM. We also have, of course, an inner membrane. Okay, so we have two sets of membranes. And what that will uh, ultimately make for us is what we call the intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, now these are going to be very, very important. This space here and what's inside of here when we get to our lecture on energy production in biological cells, okay? Uh, we'll be talking about cellular respiration and this little organelle is gonna make um, quite a significant, uh, play a significant part in that process. Cristae are these folds that ultimately are going inward into that matrixy area on the inside. So Cristae are the multiple folds inside of a mitochondria made of membrane. We have free ribosomes floating around here in the matrix. So remember, they make proteins. And um, like I said, we will revisit this organelle um, quite extensively in chapters to come. The other one that kind of has a similar relationship is called the chloroplast. But these, of course, are going to be found uh, just in plant cells, not in animal cells. Plant cells actually have both chloroplasts and mitochondria, but only plant cells have chloroplasts, not animal cells. So this organelle here is a capture of light energy. So we've all heard of photosynthesis, but this is the organelle here that does the work of photosynthesis. It's a member of a family of organelles that are called plastids. And the key to a chloroplast, and actually gives it part of its name, is the fact that it has the green pigment chlorophyll on the inside. And it has other enzymes and molecules too, as this is kind of another one of those hitchhiker little tiny organelles that's, that's really unique. And as we said, you're going to find in the leaves and the green parts of plants and algae as well. Chloroplast main structures include what we call the thylakoid system or thylakoids, and that's what all these green stacks are here of interconnected membrane. When they are in a stack, we're going to call them a granum. Let me circle a granum here. There's a granum. And then it also has the stroma, which is the fluid inside of here that kind of bathes all this thylakoid membrane system. Okay? Um, so there's the stroma, and you can see some free-floating ribosomes up in here as well in the stroma. So it kind of has its own little internal compartment, uh, very similar to the mitochondria. And again, two sets of membranes, an inner and an outer. And over on the right, this is what it looks like uh, through transmission electron microscopy. The uniqueness of a chloroplast is kind of similar to that of a mitochondria, that it has its own DNA, or again, which is different than the plant's regular nuclear DNA. So it's like another hitchhiker, a biological hitchhiker, through evolution has come and combined with another cell because it has its own DNA that's different. Here's what it looks like underneath a microscope when you look at some cells. Now these are some very healthy uh, plant cells and that remember that central vacuole I'll put CV we said it can take up 90% of the of the cells composition so that means that all the rest of the stuff is squished to the outside but that's actually a good thing because it means that the plant has adequate water and it can do all of its functions um, even with 
so much squish to the outside. And here you can see what a chloroplast also looks like um, through microscopy. Next, our cells are not just random blobs that have stuff floating every, uh, through every part of it haphazardly. There is a structure and there's an organization to it. And the set of proteins called the cytoskeleton handles that aspect. It's a network of fibers that extends through the cytoplasm, organizes the cell's structures and activities, anchors its organelles. So um, as you can see in the background here, these bluish purple blobs, that would be the nucleus. But then look at this, what almost looks like a highway system uh, of these fluorescent green, almost, uh, you know, looking threads. Now those are part of the cytoskeleton. Those anchor things in place. That, those hold the cell together. It gives transport routes for things that are being moved within cells. And it anchors some internal organelles to a certain location. So they're just not floating all over the place. Some of the components of the cytoskeleton are made of three different fibers. Uh, the first type is called microtubules. These are the biggest, the thickest of the three components. They're going to help when the cell decides to split in two. And it will also provide tracks for the movements of substances within the cell. So you can think of microtubules almost like a highway system inside of the cell. We also have microfilaments, and these are going to be really thin in comparison, but they do help the cell um, blob out and around things it wants to bring in or perhaps move the cell. And these are called pseudopodia, which translates to false feet. So if I'm a cell, let's say I'm fairly round, and I either want to move or head towards, uh, maybe there's a food source out here. And we see this extension leave the cell and blob outward. Okay, that's the that's a pseudopod, and it's due to microfilaments aiding the cell and going after this thing. And then perhaps a minute later, you know, you have that particular food right here, and it's just in a moment this side and this side will close on it and bring it in. And then we said lysosomes will then come and combine with it to digest it further. Here's a few pictures of those. Um, so here you see these big, thick green ones. Those are your microtubules right here. And then our thinner ones, these actin filaments, line the interior of the cell membrane. So you can see it pushed and strapped right up against it. And that's how we can get the cell to actually blob outward towards something. And that protein, you can see it's kind of like a twisted helix here. And then there, of course, there are some intermediate filaments that uh, kind of crisscross and provide some structural st stability to the cell so it doesn't collapse or come apart. And certain organs, or organelles will be anchored by those. Now, microtubules also play a part in cell division, we said. And they're going to grow outward from a place called the centrosome in a cell, which sits outside of the nucleus. Okay, So this area right here that's highlighted in um, yellow, this is the centrosome region. Often it will be referred to as a microtubule organizing center, or MTOC. Okay, and that puts it all together in big letters. Now, in this case here, coming out of the centrosome, you can see these black rods. Well, those are microtubules, and that's going to help when the cell decides to uh, break from one into two. And we'll definitely be visiting the process of cell division very soon. The centrosome itself is made of two centrioles. That's what these green things are right here. Okay, If we blow them up to a much bigger version, this is what they look like. Okay, A couple of um, unique-looking organelles that have microtubules in a triplet. You can see like three of them in a row, three of them, three of them, three of them. They're all at different angles to each other. And the centrioles tend to be at right angles uh, to one another as well. So you have two of these. You'll have microtubules that grow out of the centrosome region. Again, that's made of two centrioles in the center, arranged in a ring of three trip uh, micros microtubule triplets. And just to kind of give you a sneak peek of what's coming when we talk about cell division. So imagine you had a couple of centrosome regions in a cell. I'm going to draw a cell right here around it. Okay. 
look at what is down here. Hopefully you recognize these as chromosomes and these green lines here, these are the microtubules. You can see there's a little connection there. So there's gonna be a, a key part to rearranging chromosomes during cell division that is really linked to this centrosome region, again, containing microtubules and centrioles. Here's what it would look like in a, in a one type of cell. Um, notice here's our nucleus, uh, here's our uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and sitting outside the nucleus, here's our centrosome region. Perhaps uh, pretty soon the cell will, will have the need to divide into two, and then you'll start to see um, certain things happen. The centrosome will actually divide, and uh, there'll be one on each side. And then um, from there, you'll start to see microtubules grow out of it. And again, we'll talk about cellular division very soon. Here's another view of that centrosome region. You can see microtubules sticking out of it and right here. And uh, this particular cell is uh, getting ready to divide. And currently, it's in the process of it. All right, um, cells need to get around and we can call that locomotion. And that's going to be due to microtubules as well. They're gonna control the beating of cilia and flagella. Now, cilia has um, these little hair-like structures. And if I was to draw the surface of a cell, there's often a lot of them sticking off of it. And they all kind of do the same motion and a coordinated motion together. Uh, you can see it's kind of like a, a, a swimmer's arms doing you know, the breast stroke with a power stroke and then a recovery stroke where this will push back and then it will drag forward to do it again. And when you have you know, hundreds and thousands of those little cilia all over a cell doing it, it's going to create some motion and it can move, propel a cell forward. And similarly with a flagellum that's attached to many organisms. Um, it's a whip-like tail. They tend to be longer than the cilia and this will whip back and forth and when it does it will propel the cell forward. The beating pattern is a little bit different. This one just kind of squiggles back and forth and this one literally has a power stroke and a recovery stroke to move forward. All right, so we've reached the end of our topics for the cell. Again, um, it's a lot, uh, clearly. If you look at a cell, you know there's a lot in there. So the more you do every day, um, studying the parts, we said saying the names, writing the names, knowing their structure and their function will allow you to have a much better idea of what each cell does, um, what common things it goes through every day and the parts that are involved. Okay, so uh, make sure you spend a lot of time going over them, perhaps make some flashcards for the different parts and have structure and function on each card on the back, and that will definitely help you learn all the parts of the cell. So we'll talk soon, and I hope you learned a lot through this lecture. Bye-bye.